Hi, are we live? I'm not sure if we're live. I think we are. <laughs> Hi. Hi, we're Hi. live. That was a cool little book trailer. I was expecting. I know. I was so I was mesmerized. I was entranced <laughs> by the book trailer, and I was like, "Wait, hold on. Am I not watching Netflix? Oh, wait. Here I am with Ivy." I was like, "Did someone make a movie out of my book and not tell me?" <laughs> I did. I guess, yeah, you have you have to get the option agreement at some point or the, the you know, the whole thing. <laughs> um, well, OK, so um, hi, Ivy. I'm um, thrilled to be here with you. Uh, and um, I think we're going to start the the talk by doing some some introductions. I'm in going to introduce Ivy and then I'm going to introduce myself briefly. Um, and I'll start, I'll save the best for last. So I'll start with me. Um, <laughs> um, I'm Danielle Trasoni, and um, I did not really prepare a bio. So I'll just <laughs> tell you what comes to mind. Um, I, I am um, the author of seven books. Um, I've written, you know, uh, some memoirs, some novels. Um, my last book was The Puzzle Master. Um, which came out right at the same time that Ivy's book came out, and we were on the Barnes and Noble, Noble Poured Over podcast at the same time, and coincidentally met at Thriller Fest last year at this time. Huh? Um, and Ivy, as you, uh, as everyone here knows, is a fabulous, wonderful novelist. <laughs> She's the author of the critically acclaimed novels Wonder Valley, Visitation Street, and These Women. She won the 2018 Strand Critics Award for Best Novel and Frances Pre Page America, and has been a finalist for the Edgar Award and the Los Angeles Times Book, Book Prize, which she actually just won. So she's <laughs> no longer just a finalist, she's the winner of the Los Angeles Times Book Prize, among many other awards. Um, she's taught at, uh, she's a longtime teacher at Studio 526. Um, in Los Angeles' Skid Row, and she's a professor of creative writing at the Low Residency MFA program at the Palm Desert Center of the University of California, Riverside. She lives in LA with her beautiful daughter. And um, let's see, what else do I know about her? Ivy and I went, had the pleasure of spending a couple of days together in a, in a surreal conference in Dubai. <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't a couple of days. <laughs> oh, what was it? It was like a blur. Was it five days? How long was it? Seven. No. We were, no, there we were in the United Arab Emirates for seven days. Okay. So I was there for 10 blur. and you left early. It feels like such a blur. But in that time, I got, Ivy and I <laughs> were in this hotel in this strange place for both of us, strange for us, because neither oh. of us had been there before and we spent a lot of time talking. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the great pleasures of going actually, other than you know flying Emirates, which is always an experience. <laughs> um, and you know, so we would meet in the morning for breakfast and talk and we inevitably came back to books, of course. And one thing that I uh, was really struck by um, with you is the immersiveness of your process in writing a book. Um, I, I uh, felt it when I read Sing Her Down. Um, I'm just gonna show the book cover because I, I don't know if I, if I did before. Um, and so I wanted to ask you, um, how did the novel begin in your mind and how did you bring it to such a vividness on the page? Like what was your process of immersing yourself so that you could immerse us? It's interesting, um, you know, people always ask you about your process and you're like, every novel is different because my life changes all the time, you know, um, especially this one was completely different to anything I'd ever written before in terms of the process. Um, it started right, I came up with the idea a few months before COVID lockdown. My friend and I were at a bar in uh, Eagle Rock and he and I were talking about our mutual love of Blood Meridian by Cormac McCarthy. And I just um, finished writing a book called These Women, which is about violence against women. And um, we just had a few beers and I was like, no one would ever allow you to write a violent epic like Cormac McCarthy's Blood Meridian or even No Country for Old Men with women at the center of it. That's impossible. And then a few years later, I was like, I'm going to do that, you know? <laughs> and so, um, and, and I just, you know, then a few months later, COVID lockdown happened. I've, I had a small child at the time. She's not quite so small anymore. 
I was stuck in my house. Um, and she was a distance learning and I really didn't have a lot of time to write. I had like an hour to write every day, two hours, which is the fact that I wrote this book in that period is so weird to me. Um, and I, I had before lockdown the idea that I wanted to write about female prisoners. I'm not exactly sure why. Um, and then as I started writing in lockdown about prisoners, I think there was some synergy between the story and what was going on in my life. Like I was really inside, my marriage was falling apart. Like I felt really trapped. Um, I was making my marriage fall apart, not to lie. Um, <laughs> I was like pretty trapped at that moment. And I think there was, I was really working, like the more I think about it, the more I think I was really sort of using the book to sort of articulate some of my own issues that I was going through. Um, it is a book that's set during COVID, but you know, they're in prison and uh, it felt very familiar to me. So I think that like, although I am not a female criminal and people often wonder like how I was able to write about stuff like that. I feel like my experience was very much similar feeling trapped and, you know, disenfranchised. Yeah. I, you know, strangely or not so strangely enough, um, when I was reading this novel, I felt very connected to these women, even mm -hmm. though their lives are so very different from mine and, and also their impulses. I'm sorry, you're going to say something. No, I said, thank you for saying that. I mean, that was the um, point. Yeah, I felt very connected to them and I felt like their impulses, I, I felt those impulses. Maybe mm -hmm. I've never acted upon those impulses in the way that they, obviously I haven't, the way that they do. But I found that it wasn't, um, it wasn't foreign to me, which is why I think that I could read it from beginning to end and, and, and fall into that world and love it the way that I did. Um, and so I had assumed Oh, of course she went to a prison. Of course she, you know, spent lots of time there. And um, of course she interviewed probably a, a bunch of inmates. Um, and you're saying that you didn't. I didn't. Um, well, I work in Skid Row, so, um, and I've taught there for 12 years. I, I, I do know a lot of formerly incarcerated women. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that stuff was really tangible for me. Um, I have been to prisons. I have bailed a friend out of, you know, the central men's jail in LA, the Twin Towers. Um, and I have a pretty, you know, I'm pretty, I, I know a lot of people who live sort of tangential to the law, let's just say. Um, my um, uncle is an ACLU lawyer in Arizona. So I was able to ask him questions. And then the Marshall Project is a huge, huge, huge resource um, uh, for anyone who wants to write about incarceration. Um, but, you know, I do know, I, I have, it, I didn't, it's funny, I didn't do the research for this book, but I knew, I talked to people about this in the past. Um, I, uh, I had two friends who were in and out of jail um, and I just, they just told me stories about it. And, uh, you know, um, the Innocence Project also has a lot of information online about incarceration and both the Innocence Project and the Marshall Project have first person and more of the Marshall Project has first person essays about incarceration, which are fascinating and worthwhile to read. Um, I listen to a lot of podcasts. There's a Canadian podcast. I can't remember what it's called um, about women who've been incarcerated. And I listen to every single episode of Ear Hustle. I was stranded in the country during COVID. I went to New Hampshire and like would take a three hour walk a day and just consume Ear Hustle. Um, but, you know, working in Skid Row, these stories are not uncommon to me. And were you writing and researching simultaneously? So, like, would you be listening to this podcast and then go go write that day or that week? Or would you be taking notes? And I mean, just as a writer, I'm curious yeah. about, about physically how you did it. <laughs> um, no, I did it all beforehand because I couldn't write because I was full on. I didn't have any child care right. for the for March through uh, September of 2020. Yeah. And so I was like stockpiling this book in my head. And, you know, I went to visit my ex-in-laws and my dad in New Hampshire and my mom in Maine. We're all like out of the cities and um, for that period. And I just listened constantly to these podcasts and I read a bunch of books and I read a bunch of first person accounts of prison. There's a really cool um, oral history of women in prison called In This Place, Not Of It. Um, about women in prison. And I digested all this information. And I think the frustration of not being able to write was probably the best thing for me. I got back. Uh, my They started formalized distance learning at school. Um, my, our delightful babysitter was able to come back and spend a couple hours in the afternoon with Loretta, like two hours uh, of which I got to write for one. And suddenly the first th 30,000 words came out like that. 
because I was so excited. And then the next 30,000 took a minute. <laughs> As they do. <laughs> the middle. This point, I was like, yes. And then I was like, the murky middle. <laughs> <laughs> I know. I find like the middle of like, when I was in graduate school, awesome. the middle was always called the swamp, right? Like that's uh -huh. the period where you get this, you know, sort of amazing amount of energy in the yeah. first, in the first third, and then you're like, oh wait, oh, what do exactly. we do now? Exactly. Um, so I'm curious about walking that line um, of uh, about of writing about violence, and particularly about writing about women and violence. I mean, you say that the premise kind of came into being when you were talking about the disparity of representation of our darker um, uh, urges or um, about the women who have experienced these things. So when when writing this, did you find yourself sometimes going overboard? I mean, I could imagine that I would write to an extreme and then pull back and then, uh, or did you find like you could just find these characters, each of these characters had a different rhythm and, and their own level of violence that you wanted to show? Um, actually, it was quite the opposite. Oddly, I kept undercooking it because I was mm -hmm. like, women, no one's going to believe that women could do this. I was like, no, that's the point. Like, you've got to push it. Right. Um, I kept pulling back and justifying it. I really want. So basically, the idea was I wanted to write about violent women without justifying it. There are so many books out there about and I wrote about this for the Barnes and Noble um blog um, about this book. So if anyone out there wants to read more about this subject, it's something I talk about a lot. But um, I am, um, you know. We have tons of examples of men just shooting up things <laughs> like every day things or whatever. Yeah. We don't have to say, oh, well, I mean, oh, you know, it's because this happened to him in childhood. But if a woman's violent in fiction, it's always like, you know, oh, she was raped or like, you know, her family was taken away or she was abused as a kid or her husband was violent and not very nice. And it's always justified. So right. and for the most part, yes, women do kill people they know. That is that's a fact. 85% of women kill when they kill somebody, they kill somebody they know. But that leaves 15%. You know, so there are women out there who don't, but we never see them in books. Oh, the other thing we are allowed in psychological fiction thrillers is a woman who is having a psychic break who has been in right, of course. By an alien right. in her brain or like some right, other right. personality. And, then, and that you know, person the killed woman. everybody. And then right, she goes home and like as an editor at like a magazine and is fine. <laughs> And like you know, and she's back in the kitchen. Right, right. always back in the kitchen with the kids. Back in the like, kitchen, like, right? Um, I'm feeling yeah. much better now. Thank you. Exactly, and like, <laughs> and there's no correlation between those two sides of her personality. Right. But love that, you know. I didn't <laughs> want to do any of that. I was like, we're gonna have these women be fine, but it was really hard to write because I kept catching myself yeah. being like justifying it and like tempering the violence. And so there's a scene at the beginning of the book where a woman sticks a fork into somebody's. And this is this is scene. Can I just say that that scene stopped me? Like stopped my heart. I I still <laughs> remember it and the description of spaghetti, like all of it. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, no, it's it, it's violent. Well, it's weird because it's not. It, it's so they're in prison. They don't have a lot of weapons, and she sticks a fork in somebody's face and twists it like spaghetti. And in the overall scheme of the world, this is not a particularly violent scene. It is. I described it like it might be. I described like it's violent, but like let's let, let me just say without naming names, I have read some authors where there's like not so violence in there. It's like ritualistic killing. I'm like. This spork scene, people like writing me hate mail. Like, how do you write that? I'm like, listen, man, like, have you seen the TV show Oz? Have you seen what those men are doing to each other in prison? You know, have you seen Orange is the New Black too? You know, I, and I, that was sort of the testing ground for me. I was like, this is going to be unacceptable to people. And I know it's going to work. And I knew when I first got my first like Goodreads review or whatever, someone would be like, this is disgusting. I was like, yes, I'm so, <laughs> but it's not. I mean, it is violent. I did describe it in a kind of yeah. graphic way. But at the end of the day, I've had accidents just as bad. I've, you know, I've torn up my legs. I, I had a horrible accident on the side of stairs. Same kind of thing, you know? Yeah. So um, no one did it to me, but, you know, it's not, it's, yeah. So I, I was interested to see the reactions there. And women just aren't allowed to do stuff like that. They're allowed, oh, and if a man tells them to be violent, we love it too. Like bad things right. too. Right, right. Well, I found it really fresh, right? I found it, I, I had never read anything like that quite like that before and, and found it really fresh. I want to switch gears just a little bit and talk about genre. Mm -hmm. Like I love what I, another thing that I loved about this book is that it doesn't quite fall into a mystery or a thriller or a Western. I know that, you know, you were playing with those genres. And so right. when you were writing this, 
um, were you aiming more toward one genre or another, or what was your thought process? Or were you, were you just like, I'm just going to write this and see what it, what we have? Well, I knew it would be sort of, I mean, a thriller is a huge catch-all category. A mystery is definitely a much more clearer category in my brain. Like a mystery is like, let's solve what happened because we don't know what happened, you know? Um, a thriller is a lovely expansive category where it could be anything that keeps you on the edge of your seat. So I feel it's sort of, it definitely falls in that category for me. Um, and there's action. There's like action thrillers. Um, uh, I, I use the Western idea to guide me. Like, is this a traditional Western? No. Is it a cat and mouse game set in California with a cop who's like chasing down two outlaws? Yes. So like, is that make it a Western? 100%. Um, I think a Western is very much an ideology, like an idea of like space and atmosphere and lawlessness and sort of a, a different flexibility with law and crime and punishment. But yeah, no, I mean, like, people get pretty angry when you say this, like when I'm like, this is a Western, they're like, no, it isn't. It's like Louis L'Amour is a Western. Like, well, except that like, what is a Western today? You know, like I live in the West, I live in California um, where like dreams run out into the ocean. This book is sort of that kind of Western. Um, so I wanted to use that as a guide. I read a ton of Westerns as well. Um, and I was really taken by this idea of like, um, uh, you know, taking justice into your own hands. Um, and I think that's what this book is really about. And I think that's like a, touchstone of the Western genre. Um, and yeah, I mean, you know, the only books that really fit into one genre or the other are like cookie cutter books that just like play by all of the course. rules. But I think the right. cool thing about genre, about what you're doing with your books, you know, is to sort of, you know, break the frame of what people expect from a genre book. And I think that readers have become so much more flexible and generous. And I think it's a really cool time to be a genre author because, you know, people no longer just want like, traditional thrillers or traditional cold mystery like regular mysteries i think we want you know things that surprise us and not everything has a neat bow at the end and there's not always a solution or redemption and i think we have to treat our readers with a lot more respect and not give them you know formulaic answers amen i love, I love that. um i'm my favorite books right now are books that have genre elements but that absolutely deconstruct those elements throughout the book um and our so literary fun. literary writers can should can and should not that we are not literary writers i mean for well, anyone who thinks that yeah, i'm not a literary yeah, writer or yeah. danielle's not that's ridiculous we, we both, both went to literary grad schools <laughs> like um, I know. we came up with it. but i feel like when i I think a lot of like literary authors, like the ones you see, you know, in the hallowed reviews in the New York Times could learn something from a genre by appreciating like things about pacing and style. And I think the genre should be more widely read. I mean, Colson Whitehead genre books are really interesting. His, um, Absolutely. And he's but, always been doing them. Uh, yeah, you know, exactly. And he's always taken things from various genres, whether it's speculative fiction or mystery or whatever. Um, one more question and then we'll go. We have a lot of questions from oh, okay. your fans, your adoring fans. Um, I want to talk just briefly about atmosphere. You mentioned okay. something about atmosphere. And this is really like something that I loved about this book is that um, it was so vividly drawn in terms of place. And so you said, you know, as a Western, you're thinking about Western as being of the West. Mm -hmm. um, and all of this is set in Arizona, Los Angeles, um, mm -hmm. in a prison, um, out on the streets. And so, did, you know, what was what was your process of of conveying atmosphere? I mean, yeah. that's such a vague question. I'm sorry. Not but, really. It's not um, vague, actually. You know, I mean, did you go, like for me, for example, I go to the place. I, I actually have to go. I went to Japan, you know, last year to, to do research about a book that I'm writing because I had to actually physically go. Mm -hmm. And do you do that or do, is it imaginative? Do you, use, do you look at pictures? What's your process in that? Well, way? okay. So the prison I didn't go to. Um, and it's the first time I've ever written about a place I haven't been. Um, but I also knew that I could contain it in a certain way um, within certain areas. Like I looked at pictures of Perryville prison. I have been to Arizona many times, the climate of the climate. I've right. been to prisons, just not this particular prison. Um, and that felt very nerve wracking to me uh, to do that. Um, it's not my favorite thing to do. I literally do not understand how people write books about places they haven't been and spent a lot of time. Um, I made that mistake with my first novel. When I set part of it in Las Vegas, a place I didn't know anything about. and. Learn the hard way that that's not for me. Um, 
The rest of it, yeah, I mean, honestly, it's literally set outside my house where they, all that stuff where um, the women are chasing each other around LA, set in Skid Row, set on Western Avenue. And my ex-husband and I lived one block off of Western. During the pandemic, I would take a one to two hour reprieve from my house, hour and a half, and do this walk. I had two walks that I could do. I lived in a very weird neighborhood. It's not particularly attractive, um, kind of gritty, overused word gritty, but it is gritty. Um, and I set the book exactly where I was walking. Like every street that I walked on is in that book. And I, like, and then when it came out, I was like, oh, I don't want to even think about these places. Cause like for two years I walked around them and like, I was just sick of it. You know, um, yeah. I can't even walk some of those streets. I, I, my daughter is a friend who lives on one of them. And I had never been to their house until last weekend. I was like, oh my God, no. Like, <laughs> <laughs> so interesting that you say yeah. that. I feel that way too with books. Like yeah. I don't ever read my books again. Yeah, and no. I have a really hard time even revisiting the characters. Or, and yeah. it's interesting that you say that about place, especially yeah. because you will eventually have to go on, on these streets in LA again. Oh, it happened with Wonder Valley, which is set like it opens with this guy running down the one ten freeway naked, and um, this is kind of like self-aggrandizing story, but. I wrote it and I used to drive that stretch of the highway a lot. And then I was interviewed at NPR and the interview came on while I was driving my daughter to school on that stretch of freeway. And I'd never put it together that that was the same thing. And I was like, I'm never going to be able to look at this the same way again. I'm going to drive her to school every day down the stretch of the 110. I'm going to think about that book and I don't want it to do this anymore. <laughs> yeah, I know. Like, okay, change the channel, right? Okay, yeah. Um, I am going to take a few questions sure. from your readers. I have them here on a different screen. Okay. So there is a question here from Rachel. Who is your favorite character um, that you have that you, you created in this book and why? Oh, huh, that's a trick question. Um, you know, I mean, I like them all. I think the one I'm proudest of is Dios because that's the biggest swing. I mean, that's the one where I got to do what I wanted to do. I mean, she's the most aggressive. She's the most um, difficult and challenging. And she was also the hardest to write because, you know, you can't have too much of someone who's that violent and that sort of unhinged, but she's also very smart and she's also very intelligent. And what I wanted to say is that when Danielle at the beginning said that, like, you could identify with pieces of these women, although we are nothing like them, that's the exercise. It's like women are being we're being the act of being a woman in today's world is being like living in the wake of violence every day. Like people are catcalling you or whatever they're doing, or just like do, putting you down. Um, and I feel like Dios is sort of the apotheosis of that reaction that I have to all of those things. Um, it was the hardest to write. I mean, the, there's a reason the book's kind of short. It's not like, you can't, you can't do too much there. Um, and the fact that I was able to pull it off and make her feel real and that her motivations come from real places, but she's not like a psychopath or a sociopath was a real accomplishment. I'm very proud of myself. So yeah, D Dios. Yeah. I mean, I love, I love Lobos too. I love them all, but like, I'm going to go with that one. Okay. All right. Dios. Um, and how long, oh, another question is how long did it take you to finish saying her down? This is from Aaron. Um, and then after you answer that, how long does it typically take you to finish a novel and how much do you, how much time do you spend on research? Um, I research as like, I mean, this one was different, as I said earlier, like, because I had that six months before I could start writing it during COVID. So I had done a lot of, I don't like research research. I don't go to libraries, I don't, but I, I'm taking things in, you know, I'm writing a new book now and it, well, I just finished it today, actually. <laughs> it hey. Wow. Congratulations. I'm going to send you two. Um, <laughs> so, um, you know, Every book is different, and this one was particularly weird. It's much shorter than my other books, um, and I could only write one to two hours a day. It didn't take me very long to get a draft, which is unusual. It took me, like, nine months. But then I spent another year revising it. I don't revise like the traditional person. Like, I just keep going. I don't, like, sit down. I don't write a terrible draft that I have to rewrite. I write a pretty good draft, and then I just keep going in and going deeper and taking it deeper and deeper. I call it, like, combing through it. So it feels like this, my brain starts to like relax when I have that draft and I can, um, but I think my drafts are clean. Like that's just the way I write. I write, usually write quite slowly, um, 500 to a thousand words a day and they're, it's neat. And I, I'm never writing anything that I'm thinking I'm going to throw out. Um, that's not how I work. Um, so this book from start to finish, like, 
I started it in, when did it come out? It came out last year. It was 2023. So it took me like two, one and a half years, two years, you know, which doesn't seem like a lot to me. Yeah, that's fast. I mean. Yeah, it's short though. I mean, this book's like a bullet. Like there wasn't a lot of space. Like I wanted to go start to finish like real fast. And But it's so dense, right? It's, yes. Okay. Maybe the word count is shorter, but every page feels, feels, you know, really, really thought through and, um, I don't know the word that keeps coming to my mind is like thickened, right? right? Like, like you've been in, you've been across those pages many, many times, clearly. Yeah. 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 Yep. Okay. So let's see. Um, uh, so this is a process question from Michelle. She she asked, do you have a writing routine? And if so, what is it? Again, it changes. <laughs> um, <laughs> Every day, is different. every day is different if uh, I'm divorced. So I have my kid half time. So the days I have my kid, I cannot work first thing in the morning because apparently she used to go to school. I found out. Um, no. So like I uh, then I, I go to school and I go work out because her school is by my athletic club. And then I try to write from like 11. I often have to take a nap if I work out in the morning. It's so embarrassing. <laughs> I've been that way forever. Like I just get really tired. Um, I take a nap and I feel a little drugged and hallucin hallucinating when I wake up from said nap. Um, and then I work, you know, or I, I work for a bit and then I fall asleep. Um, uh, I don't sleep enough at night when I have her because I stay up kind of late. Um, and she gets up early, but, um, I try to, if I don't have Loretta, I get, I start working by eight 30. I work from eight 30 to one 30 and that's it. I'm done. Um, I can do other stuff after that. I can, might be able to edit something. I do have other work too. You know, I have student work for my students or, but I just write for four hours a day. And of those four hours, I'm probably only writing two. The rest I'm probably, you know, looking at, you know, tennis scores online or something. <laughs> you know? Like I'm not, I'm not going to lie. Like I want to be very clear about what being a writer is like. It's about like, not looking at the internet all day or pretending that you're not, but you really are. You know? Yeah. Um, I'm shopping. Looking oh, totally. At all that, yeah, please. I'm moving now. So like there's a lot yeah. of furniture and, like fabrics that I'm looking at. So, I'm so, like if people knew really what's going on. It's um, but I so, wonder how long we could work, could write a book if we actually did none of that, right? Like, just you know, it took me longer, that. it turns out. Maybe, I mean, so when I wrote, you know, my first books, yours too, that came out before like the super internet age, right? Yeah, yeah. But they took forever to write. Was that because, I don't know why. Was it because we were just starting out? Or was it because we didn't have fun things to distract us? <laughs> like, yeah, I think so. I mean, mine took, my that book took four years, my first yeah, novel. My first book too. Took forever. Yeah. It's longer. Was is your first book longer than than your yeah. other ones? No, it's about the same. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um okay, so um have you ever this is a question from Anne. Have you ever considered writing a series? No. No. <laughs> okay. Well, um you know, Lobo, who's in this book, also appears in these women. Um I had to change her name for reasons that are a little complicated um the book was under option and it, i just changed her name um a lot of my characters do reoccur and there's like little i hate the expression easter eggs but like there are characters who pop back and forth in these books um there's a character in visitation street who's also a major character in wonder valley ren um i was trying to bring a character from i've had this idea to bring another character from visitation street back sometimes i use old characters to jumpstart the writing process because i know them already um but a series you know, I would really like to actually this. You, you know what? That's not true. I would really like to write a series about Detective Lobos, but I can't because the book is under option. Ah, oh, that's no. like that's heartbreaking <laughs> when that happens. Um, ah, oh, okay. Well, I won't dig farther. I won't dig further into that one. Oh, you know what um, happened to you, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> Okay, so there are many. I have a lot of questions here from somebody in this chat. Says, "What is Skid Row?" Um, Skid Row is just the um, tr the neighbor a neighborhood in downtown Los Angeles, which is like the traditionally homeless uh, neighborhood. Um, but there's a lot of um, supportive housing, and um, it's a really interesting community. And there are many arts uh, artists who are unhoused or formerly unhoused. Um, so I've been teaching creative writing there for 13, 12 years at, um, now I teach at the Skid Row um, History Museum and Archive, which is fun. And it's open to the whole community. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, there's a kind of an odd question that I okay. really, that I'm gonna okay. ask this is from Lynette, um, okay. because I've never heard anyone ask this question before. Oh, I can't uh, wait. <laughs> so if you could write 
at any time in history for a month, when would it be and why? Like basically if you could time travel and write in that time. This, this, this assumes that I have a knowledge of history. Which is like, <laughs> yes, know. it does. Like it, maybe it could be even in your own history, like going back to when you were. Oh God. Yeah. I would love to write with like at the Hemingway Paris period. Easy answer. Like 100%. I want to hang out, like and do that shit. Excuse me. Do that stuff. Like that sounds amazing to me. You know, Can I come to well, yeah, we'll go totally. yeah. yeah. I don't want to go too yeah. much earlier because things weren't so hot for women before that. Like I got to be careful. That's true. People are always like, I want to go back to this time period. I'm like, you want to be a woman? And like, <laughs> what are you talking? I feel like yeah. The Hemingway Paris period, while not perfect for women, had a lot of possibility and a lot of, you know, cool expat stuff. And yeah. Completely. We could hang out with Gertrude. Totally. Right? totally. Like, we would have a great time. Um, Those Passos, Archibald McLeish, all these not well-behaved men. I'll take right. Gertrude with them, too. Right. Kiki de Montparnasse. Oh, oh my, my God, God. That'd be amazing. Did you ever read that book, um, Everyone Was So Young? It's a really cool memoir of, uh, yeah. That yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I had it, I read it a long, a while ago. Um, I, so I, you know, I have a fascination with Paris. So yes. all, of that, um, all of that sounds, sounds fabulous to me. I'm so excited that I could answer that question. <laughs> I'm so excited too. And that's such a good answer. I don't know what I would have, I, I seriously. You probably come up with the same answer. <laughs> I might've come up with the same answer. I also kind of have, a, you know, the 60s. Oh, your answer? Oh, the 60s? I mean, I don't know if that would be my answer, but I, I kind of have, I love this idea of when publishing was publishing, right? There was, yeah. you know, the heyday of publishing mm -hmm. between like the yeah. 60s to the 90s, early yeah, exactly. 90s. Oh, maybe the early 90s. Yeah, not so far a lot away. Yeah, I don't know. I, I have you could a, be like an author with a capital A. I, I could yeah. be an author. Oh, totally. and I could like type my manuscript and yeah, totally. mail it or hand deliver it to my I, editor in New York. Yeah, like a three martini lunch with like. Absolutely. Yeah, that sounds oh, great too. It sounds kind of exotic. I don't know. I probably would be there and hate it because, you know, I'd find something that I didn't like about it, but it sounds, it sounds good on paper. So, okay. We have about five, between five and 10 minutes left. So, um, I want to find another good one. Um, okay. So this, this is about your plot plotting. No, I mean, you, we've all heard it that, you know, some people like to plot, you know, make an outline and plot things in advance and other people just like to get through the draft and then like figure out what they've got. And so Donald is asking, what approach um, or strategies do you use to conceptualize the plots of your books and how much is tied to current events? And are oh, and then this is a totally separate question, but are you already working on the next book, which we know you are, but maybe you can say something about okay. your process. Are you just finished it? Uh um, so, you know, again, like I'm 47 years old and I've been doing this for almost two decades, which is just mind blowing to me, you know, like no one at my age would do anything for two decades, you know, it's bizarre, but I started my first book way before I was 27 and, you know, I had to learn how to write and I had no, no skill with plot. And, um, I have never succeeded in writing an outline in my life. I feel it for me, it suffocates the, um, process and it feels very um regimented and I feel less inspired when I write when I have to like fill in the blanks and but um I realize as I've gotten older and more you know advanced in my career that story like I'm able to like come up with like there are ideas in my head that are plot based and I can discard them if they're not plot based so like now that when I started to write I already I already sort of have an idea of momentum like I can't just like sit down and say, well, I want to write a book, you know, set in Skid Row about like, and set out in the desert. And I don't know what's going to happen, which is the plot of Wonder Valley. And it was like tears and horrible things were happening in my brain because I just had this idea about <laughs> characters in place. Now by setting out to do that, I would think, but what's happening to these people? Like, what's the thing right. that's you, know, you can't just describe them? Um, the way I like to think about it is like one of my writing instructors in graduate school told me this, and it really resonates with me. And sort of the way I think about plot is, let's say you're driving from New York to Los Angeles, like you go straight across the country and eventually you take a left. Like, you know, when you hit the coast, so you gotta go south. And like, for me, that's all I need. I'm like, I have these two women in prison. I need to get them to LA. So that's right. all I need to do. Like first we've, so what are the steps? Okay, well, they gotta get released from prison. So what are some of the things that would be an impediment to that? Like, well, it's COVID, so they're probably gonna be um, 
quarantines and like, okay, what's a cool way to get them to LA on like an illegal bus? You know, so I have a general sense and I had this idea that I wanted it to end in a sort of Western shootout, but that's all I knew, you know? But that for me is enough. But if I don't have any of those things, if I just want to run about two female prisoners, well, I'm just be running in circles. Um, so I built like little tent poles along the way or little like bus stops to, and that's all I need. And then, so, I mean, this is me personally asking. Um, yeah. So then do you go back in revision and plant more um, sort of plot-like elements or do you just let it ride on the tent poles that you've planted? Um, yeah, because as I'm writing, I'll find other things. Like, okay, so like, then you're just constantly- so yeah, if I, yeah, right. So I just have this general sense that like, we're gonna get, so like they're gonna be released from prison and I need to get them on this bus. But like it's there, ha things have to happen. So it, it, that allows me to relax and figure out what happens in between there. And then like you know, they're little. I I will go back. There's not enough drama or like things aren't making sense, obviously. But um, I, within that, I'll find be, just knowing just knowing one big, you know, goal. Let's get them on the bus. It allows right. me to relax and find miniature goals in between. Right, right. It's interesting because it feels the momentum of this book is there right like from the very first page you know that there you know that it's moving um so that's that it really works Thanks. um so i think we have time for one more question okay. um so i feel like this is a load a loaded question okay so i don't that's fine because i don't i don't even consider you this but it might open up a discussion about how we get classified Right. So the question is from Tammy and it's, how did you get your start as a mystery author? Oh, I can answer that question. Okay. And, and okay. I'll, I'll jump in later. I have a very clear answer to that question. Um, I wrote a book in graduate school that turned into visitation street. And um, what I thought I'd written a book about was about the community in Brooklyn where I was living, which is sort of an isolated waterfront community called Red Hook. And I was in my mind had described, um, various people in this community um, and what they were doing. Um, because I wasn't good at plot, the first draft didn't have a uniting um, element. So um, it starts, I wrote this kind of, what I think is a pretty cool opening about two girls who decide to take a raft out on the river one hot board night and one returns and the other doesn't. Um, but really, for me, it was a book about everyone in the community because it's a very, it's an interesting community. It's a very segregated black and white, um, working class waterfront white and a lot of black families in the projects, um, housing project. Anyway, I sold it. I thought I had sold like my new Jennifer Egan visit from the Goon Squad book or, you know, my Jonathan Lethem Fortress of Solitude. And my editor showed me the cover. And I was like, Whoa. you know, it's a nice cover, but why is it quite so dark? And she's like, oh, we got you. We're going to get you a blur from Dennis Lehane. And I was like, why would Dennis Lehane read this book? And she's like, well, you wrote a mystery. And I was like, I, I wrote what? She's like, you wrote a mystery. Like, these girls go missing on the first page and you find out what happens to them. Like, in the last chapter, that's a mystery. And I was like, oh, I didn't know that. You know, it never occurred to me. Like, it was six to eight months after we finished the book. You know, she never mentioned it. And um, we were we were going into production, like, and that was like for the, and I was like, oh my god, a mystery. And then she's like, you got to write another one. I was like, how do you do that? <laughs> like, I have no idea. She just makes someone vanish. So that's the opening of Wonder Valley. I was like, I'm like, okay, this guy goes running naked on a highway and he vanishes. <laughs> so that's I love it. <laughs> oh my god, I love it so much. And I feel like that's how we find out what our genre is, is we get it from our publisher. Exactly. And, and I, you know, the same happened with me with Angelology. I thought I had written this sort of like literate, sprawling literary novel. It turns out it's a speculative thriller. Okay. A speculative thriller. Okay. I, I mean, far be it for us to decide what to do. Honestly, I would have no idea. So I think that, I think that it's actually a good thing, but um, have you used that as a kind of North, star for your you know career to wrap things around you know i'm mixing metaphors in a terrible way there we go back on back on track with the metaphor. Um, um, yeah i do because you know it's funny like it would be hard for me just to come up with a plot that didn't have like i like dark stuff like i'm i'm funny and lighthearted, but like i'm so i 
I like books where something happens and something you got to figure something out. Yeah. I, realized, I really I grew up reading tons of mysteries as a kid and like, you know, lots of Tony Hillerman and Elizabeth Peters and Ann Perry and blah, blah, blah. Um, I love that stuff. Um, and, you know, it's a great jumping off point because a lot, there's too many books out there where nothing happens, you know, and at least in a mystery or a thriller, something happens. I do now start with like that kind of thing and then pull as far back from it as I can. Um, yeah. It's not traditional, but I'm like, something needs to happen. And, you know, I think crime is a really good way to explore community. It's a really good way to explore, like, you know, Michael Connelly's books are so cool because they're taking you into like communities in LA you would never heard, heard of. It's same with Walter Mosley. Um, so yeah, I, I like to think of something happening that's maybe a little unsavory and then figure out where we go from there while sort of not dwelling so much on the tenets of mystery. Yeah. Okay, well, I think that we're at the... Hmm. Uh-oh. I think Danielle froze. Everybody, um, uh, that if you haven't read Ivy's book, um, go to Barnes and Noble and get a copy. It's the mystery thriller um, pick of the month. So you will see it stacked up in a big <laughs> pile right at the front. Reduce those piles, please. Yeah, reduce <laughs> those <laughs> piles, <laughs> right? Let's go reduce some piles. And if you can't get, if you can't get to the store, um, <laughs> you know, go online and, and order it. Um, it's a It's an amazing, amazing book. And I know that you're going to love it. Thank you so much, Danielle, for taking the time to do this. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you guys all for attending. Middle of the day. <laughs>